Uh, our first speaker is Axel Songsted, and he'll talk about scalable non-parametric L1 density estimation via sparse subtree partitioning. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, we can, I can start with some overview. So this has been like an over, uh, ongoing uh, project uh, by, by uh, several papers. And uh, okay. yeah, so the setting we will be dealing with are so we have some IID sample x1 to xm with some common distribution mu and of density f. What we want to achieve or get is a nice estimator depending on the sample which is asymptotically, asymptotically consistent in uh, L1 to, with regards to the density. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I not record? Uh, I think you recorded. Yeah, it's okay. not recording. Okay, good. It's recording. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. At least. There What did you <laughs> Oh, yes. so the estimators we'll be dealing with are data driven histograms, which just means that the partitioning that the histogram is based on depends on data. Uh, the histogram will have universal performance guarantees. So um, the estimator, we can set some guarantees on the estimator's performance regarding no matter what the underlying density F is. Uh, and the estimator is built for distributed computing in mind. Uh, so we can use it in big data. There exists at least two implementations of the, this method we will be talking about. So one non distributed in C by Rosesh and uh, Gloria, I think. And then we also have a one distributed implementation using Spark and Scala, which has been yeah, several papers, which is also the one I've been contributing to. So we first need to talk about how to create these partitions, which we want ourselves to depend on. And uh, we do that by having regular pavings which are a recursive mathematical structure uh, in D dimensions. And we have one root box. Uh, and if we want to split the regular paving, then the axis we split along is the axis where the, the paving or the root box is the longest, has the longest side. And if the root box have several box sides, which, are, which achieves this maximal length, we just choose the one in the first dimension. Furthermore, when we split the regular paving, we always split in the middle of that side. So we will always create two new boxes or regular pavings with the same volume. So just as a quick example, we have a regular paving with one box uh, with equal lengths of both sides. We assume that the x dimension is the first one, so we will split perpendicular to x in the first uh, iteration. Now, if you, no matter which of these two boxes we want to split, we now have that the uh, longest side is along the y-axis. So when we split them, we will have to split perpendic perpendicular to y. And now we have regained the, yeah, the thing about the box is having equal lengths on every side, so we split along x again. So some nice properties of this are that uh, yeah, the splitting of a regular paving is always deterministic. We just, we just follow the rules. We can view a sequence of splits as a binary tree, which we saw in the previous example. Uh, two equivalent trees that refers to the same root box will create the same partitioning. So 
yeah, for a given root box, uh, uh, I, every binary tree represents a unique partition of the root box. And lastly, the partitioning is of course uniquely expressed by its leaves. So we want to uh, map our cells to some, uh, some values. So in this case, we have an example here where, yeah, we want to map our cells to some perhaps account for the number of points found in it. So we have a integer value map regular paving in this case, uh, but the, we can define the, the mapping set to be whatever. But we will concern ourselves with mostly about counting. So Johannes Groner, a previous Mozart student here, uh, showed that and created this sparse tree implementation representation of map regular pairs. So you can define some uh, arithmetic between. So we, if we have two binary trees uh, representing some map regular paving, we may define some arithmetic between the trees. And in this arithmetic, we usually have some identity element. So in the case of counting points, the identity element is zero. So we can just implicitly have them in our representation. We don't have to explicitly store them in memory. And this would be very useful later. Furthermore, uh, we can, uh, from another paper we have that we can represent each leaf or cell in the partition or the regular paving as just a sequence of bits. So we have just a label which, of bits, which represents the path from the root down to the leaf. We can also define in this sparse representation when we only store leaves at the bottom, we can define an ordering which represents like informally just a left right ordering of the tree. So L1 is less than Ln if L1 is to the left of uh, leaf Ln. So statistical regular pavings are non zero integer valued map regular pairings. Uh, and we will use them to count points. And using this, we can define a histogram estimate on the statistical regular paving by having that each cell's probability will be, uh, it is equal to the proportion of points we will uh, find in it and so Now we get to the first algorithm, the SCB tree Markov chain. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we have some a root box or a statistical regular paving with only a root box. We have that all points are encapsulated by it. And uh, we define or we give a count limit which is the amount of points that is allowed to be found in the maximum amount of points that is allowed to be in any cell in our statistical regular paving. Furthermore, we also give a maximum number of leaves that is allowed to be in our binary tree. Now, the rules for splitting our statistical regular paving in this algorithm is as follows. We continuously split the box that we found that, that has the largest amounts of points in it. And if there are several boxes or cells with the same number of maximum points, we choose one at random. The algorithm terminates uh, successfully if we have that every cell has just gone below the count limit or yeah, no cell should exceed the count limit of points found in it. And we don't exceed the maximum number of leaves. 
So just to quickly know what, what, what is what is SCB stand for? Uh, statistically equivalent blocks are not too. Uh, yeah. But so we have a theorem here that says tells us when when we run this algorithm we get a successively more refined partition. And at every iteration, we can define some histogram upon this, uh, on the state of the Marble chain. We, this algorithm tells that when the output, which our Marble chain pro produces, uh, the histogram defined upon it, as uh, the number of sample points goes to the limit, will be asymptotically consistent to the true underlying density of our sample given some assumptions. So we just, uh, the number of leaves should uh, grow sublinearly compared to the sample size. The count limit should also uh, grow sublinearly with regards to sample size and then we also have We want the count limit to go to infinity and we have some, we need, we always need a certain amount leaves in our tree. Now, the histogram produced by the Marco chain is not the one we will be using as the final estimate. So we need some more definitions before we can go into that. So it, if we have two densities, F theta and F omega in D dimensions, then we define a chef set between them as the set where f theta is larger than f omega. And we can also define yeah, a second one where f omega is larger than f theta. Uh, we, are, we will in, interest ourselves in finding the best estimate among a class of estimates. So we don't, so we need some, um, yeah, a class of estimates basically. So. Uh, yep. If we have several densities indexed by some little theta in big theta, then we define the Yatrakos class A big theta as the set of all the chef sets found between our estimates in big theta. So this could apply for us that we, along the Marco Shane path, which our algorithm produces, we may perhaps pick certain states along it and use those histograms to find those states as our estimate, estimates in a Yopperkos clause. Uh, yeah. So the estimate we will finally, which we want to find is the minimum distance estimate uh, and it is in our, yeah, so we define big uh, delta theta for uh, estimate f theta as the supremum of the absolute distance between our estimate f theta and the empirical measure over our, all the chef sets in our Yatrakos clause. Now, the minimum distance estimate is then defined as the estimate uh, for, uh, which indexed by our big theta, which minimizes this supremum. So we basically find the estimate that, that uh, is, at the worst, uh, which minimizes the worst uh, difference between itself and the empirical measure on our Yotko's clause. Uh, now, the number of chef sets in a Yotko's clause grows quadratically to the number of estimates found in which uh, the Yotko's clause is based on. So we cannot consider the whole path of estimates in our Markov chain because we might split perhaps 
several ten thousands of times. So we will get an extreme amount of estimates. What we instead can do is do a, an adaptive search along our path and find you know, something good at least. So what we do is along our path of more and more refined histograms, we pick evenly spaced points along it and find among those states the minimum distance estimate. When we have found the best performing one of these evenly spaced points along our path, then we can zoom in on the best one and get more and more. Yeah, we basically zoom in until we compare basically histograms that are, that are equally complex. And in the end, we get something hopefully quite performant. And lastly, since the minimum distance estimate, is defined on our Markov chain, which is based on our sample and the empirical measure that is also based on the sample. We want to, we have some dependence between the estimates and the empirical measure. So we just create a validation set, which is a fraction of the sample size, a fraction of the sample and let and base the empirical measure on that and use the other fraction of data as the training sample for our mark of shape. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of time. The point here is that we can, given a class of uh, a, a class of indices for our for some estimates, which are histogram estimators and their densities, then uh, and the histogram estimators are found on our path. We can. There we can get an upper bound on the expectation on the minimum distance estimate found in from our Yatakos class or not our class of indices. We can find we get an upper bound on the expected distance from it to the underlying density F, which can be whatever density. And it is upper bounded by three times the minimum the expected uh, distance between the, the minimum expected distance in our class of uh, estimators. And then there's some extra stuff. But uh, we now get into the distributed setting. So uh, there's a paper that notes that we can, uh, since we want to split every cell down to the count limit or just below the count limit, we don't actually have to do this prioritizing, splitting the box with the largest amount of points in it. Uh, we can just split everything down to the count limit in any order uh, we wish. And uh, this sparse representation of map regular pavings, which we defined before, allows us to we can basically split down to um, any level at all. Since the number of cells we have to represent in memory is always upper bounded by the number of points in our data set. So the idea is that here we have split the regular uh, box four times in refined for each data point, the box, it, it, it is found in, in at depth four. So in memory, we, we would always only store these highlighted ones. The rest can't, we can skip. Uh, and Johannes Kroner approached this SCB, uh, this Markov chain problem from uh, a bottom-up approach. So what he instead did was 
using a sparse representation that he could uh, split down the data extremely low so that every box perhaps only had a count of one or zero. And then he success iteratively started merging up the boxes to a valid output of the Markov chain. And this is very nice in the distributed computing. It maps very well to that. So now the, the method or algorithm for the whole estimation process can be found, uh, can be categorized as these four stages. We find a box hull of all the points. Then we know that yeah, we have a box which contains all the points. Then for each point, we say that we want the box it is in at depth D, and we choose that to be very high perhaps such that every box only, every cell at that depth only contains zero and ones. Uh, we then backtrack from this super refined partition up to a valid output from our Markov chain. So we know that it will be on this asymptotically consistent path. And then we can find the minimum distance estimation stuff. And my contributions has been focusing on this backtracking stuff because that is where some redu reduction in communications can be done in a network of computers. So this was, in, so there's an implementation of this in Spark and Spark is a di distributed computing engine where that straps, abstracts away a lot of distributed computing details. And the idea is that we have a data set which are, is, resides on several machines. The, the set of data is, uh, re, resides in a set of partitions where every partition re, is, re, resides on some specific machine. And one machine can always have several partitions of data. One machine is assigned to be the driver which creates tasks for workers and the workers executes those tasks. Uh, and uh, we can create partitioners, which, uh, so we can create partitioners, partitioners which give us fine control over where data should reside. So we can basically assign the data to a specific partition, uh, which we'll get into soon. And the idea is of course to rip reduce the communications of the backtracking process. So the issue with the previous backtracking is that when we start merging up cells with some count, uh, we don't know if those two cells uh, in memory resides on different machines. So there will have to be some communi communications between workers and so on in order to stop merging stuff. The solution to this is to find large subtrees of cells with some non-zero count in them and assign them to specific partitions. If, by doing that, we know that the machine containing the partition of that subtree can merge that subtree all the way up to its root completely locally. No communications has to come. Why is communication bad? Yeah, it is just, Costly, so there's always there's, uh, yeah. Communications in a network is basically costly. We have to send a lot of data over the network, and we will it quickly becomes a bottleneck in uh, in the algorithm. Uh, so the rough outline of the algorithm is to we have partitions of data residing on several machines. The driver then samples data from each partition uh, where each leaf or cell which we part, uh, sample is assigned some weight. We, the driver then sorts the data in this left-right ordering. Uh, so we will, yeah, the dr driver will basically have a, conti a, conti a contiguous array of memory which maps to like a binary tree. 
And then we find large subtrees in this sample data uh, according to our weight limit. So we basically, basically do the backtracking stuff again, just using weights. So these weights, uh, oh, I'll get into that soon. And then when we have found these large subtrees, which we, then we, these large subtrees, we assign to some partitions and the way we assign them to partitions is just, uh, we just want the weight among the partitions to be somewhat balanced. And then for any leaf in our, or cell in our original data set, we map, we map the leaf to the same partition as the closest generated subtree. So then we have defined this mapping between leaves and partitions. So I'll just go through an example of the whole method to just get a slight idea of what's happening. So we have one machine with one partition with even leaves, L1, L3, and L15. We have machine two with leaves L2, L4, L16. And we can suppose that every leaf has some account of one. This is then represent, then we split it down to depth four. So we have this perfect, perfectly distributed uh, sub uh, tree where each leaf or this uh, binary tree where each leaf has a count of one. Now what we want to do is we sample points or cells from this uh, tree, send it to the driver. So in this case, we sample L1, L3, L9, L11, L13 from partition one. The weight every one of those leaves are assigned represents how many points those leaves represent. So since we have eight points in the sample, we represent five points, or we sample five points from the sample, then every point more or less uh, represents eight divided by the five points. We sample L2, L4, and L14 from partition two, and they are assigned a weight of eight divided by three. Now, the idea is that we want to find large non-intersecting subtrees with respect to some, to the weights of the leaves. And it's, yeah, it's the same idea as backtracking. And we can do this in N log N, where N is the uh, sample size. And then we record the deepest subtree which we generate. So, um, yeah, we re or we record the depth of the deepest subtree. Now, suppose we set a weight limit of 8.0. Then we will find one maximal subtree between one and two, which has a weight of 4.26. We will find another one, L3, L4, which has a weight of 4.26. We cannot merge them because that will exceed the weight limit. And to the right, we create this subtree S3 with a weight of 7.46. And we can, of course, not merge anymore uh, because we would exceed the weight limit. So in then we have these three subtrees with which we generated. Note that we have not generated any subtrees representing these leaves, but uh, that does not matter as we shall see. So the way we distribute our trees among the partitions is by using a well-known rule from approximation theory. Uh, it is the longest processing time rule. So the idea is just that we want to, we always, we sort our trees according to their weight. We pick the one with the largest weight and assigns it to the partition with the smallest weight in total. So at the start, we can we pick S1 and assign it to partition one. In the second iteration, we have that partition two has the smallest weight or weight of zero, so we assign it to S2. And again, we assign S3 to partition two again. And you can pr prove the, how well this actually 
distributes uh, the weights in comparison to the optimum solution. Now, we have assigned our partitions, or we have assigned our subfees to the partitions. Now we want to actually map every leaf in our original sample to some partition. So the one, part, uh, the partition we map our leaf to is the partition which the closest subtree which we generated of the tree is mapped to. Uh, and uh, so in the case of our generated trees, we will get leaves L9 up to L16 residing on partition one, we will get L1 to L8 on partition two. And the thing, the point here is that all of this, the whole algorithm basically re requires one all to all communication between all workers. We only have to do one large communication between all workers uh, one time. Then when we have assigned our leaves and the leaves reside on the, on the correct machines, now that when we want to do our local merging of the cells, we know that we, we can always merge up all the cells up to the recorded depth which of our, so the subtrees which we generated in our algorithm. We know that the subtree which has the which had the largest depth by the smallest subtree which we generated, that is a depth that any machine can merge up to locally without having to do any communications. So that is what is done. And if any more merging need to take place, which I'm not seeing happen, we can just signal to the driver and it can do the, the rest. Uh, so some quick results here. We ran the we ran the algorithm for a uniform distribution of 1000 dimensions, 10 to the power of eight points. We achieved an L1 error of five times 10 to the power of minus three. And it took one hour and 37 minutes. We were also run a Gaussian uh, with five dimensions with the same amount of points, we could not we cannot uh, easily get an L1 error due to difficulties with integration. And the time was 11 minutes. So there's there's one thing here that when we want to find our minimum distance estimate for the Gaussian along our path, we find that the algorithm exits early from the loop because the the remote the most refined histogram that we give the algorithm is found to be the best performing one. So what we would actually need to do is get an even more refined histogram so we can continue our search further down, but we're limited by memory. Yeah. And that is also why yeah. since we exited earlier, the timing is much better. So here we can see the stages, what time they took for the different cases. The uniform took 52 minutes for finding the box hole, and 34 minutes for find labeling every data point. Uh, and the get MD took eight minutes. So uh, it's not too surprising because these two are dependent on the dimensionality of the data. So if we have a, lo a lot of dimensions, we have to do a lot of comparisons and work in those two stages. That is also why it took so, why it went so quick for the Gaussian case. But we are more in, mostly interested in, it is the most inter interesting for us to look at the merging stage. So the previous uniform merging took five minutes and 30 seconds. And my, uh, algorithm which reduced the communications took one minute and 35 seconds. The Gaussian case took seven minutes and my took three minutes. And that roughly corresponds to how much less data we have to shuffle around the network in that stage. 
yeah, some quick discussion is that the Holland labeling, yeah, the, those stages depend on dimensionality of the data. Uh, depending on what depth we choose to split down to, when we do more splits, we have to represent the path becomes longer down to every leaf. So every leaf requires more bits to represent the path. And uh, yeah, so we, we, it does affect our performance too, uh, by increasing the memory usage in the algorithms. Uh, so, and then this affects the merging and the minimum distance estimate stages. Furthermore, uh, the minimum distance estimation stage is uh, also is affected by the complexity of the underlying this uh, underlying density. So if we have a very complex this uh, density, we will require a lot of cells to roughly estimate it, and we would then in this adaptive search we do, we will mostly look at chef sets around that complexity. So the chef sets will be larger, and we will have more computations to do. And as for now. The method is limited by the memory usage in this minimum distance estimation. We could not uh, accurate, find a, perhaps as good of an estimate for the Gaussian five dimensional case as we would want to, but we, uh, we would need more memory. Yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, is there time for some questions? Yeah, I guess Hopefully. when you say we need more memory, it's uh, because we need more money to get yeah. the drivers and a lot more RAM than eight gigs. Or... Yeah, sure. We, we do need some more money. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, in fact, there's one question. Just to respond. Yeah, so. The project is uh, the, the library I've been contributing to is built on Spark uh, and Scala, basically. Yeah. So do this implementation could you say anything like the data frame ecosystem or did you have like the, the bounty that I did in the We did have to go down to the RDB. I'm not sure if you can do it in data frames, but the idea is that you need some very fine. Mm -hmm drained like uh, we need to be able to map the single data points to specific partitions and so on. so we need this fine grained control which i think only rdd is here so i'm just trying to understand some of the First, so check you're sort of first doing some split and then you, you're checking all of the points, or you're doing like one point at a time and you adapt the splitting as you do. Okay. okay. The, the Markov chain algorithm, which produces this asymptotically consistent estimate, estimator, uh, that one actually like is fully sequential. So we have. Uh, the splitting is always dependent on how many points there are in each cell. So we always, the idea is that we split the one with the most points. Now we can't actually just skip that by using this sparse representation. What we do is that we just pick an absurd depth where every cell basically has either a count of one or zero. So we are way beyond the actual line. But I'm thinking like yeah, how to even get to that point. I mean, so I'm thinking like, okay, I have this huge data set, lots mm -hmm. and lots of points. So now I want to build some kind of tree out of this. But the, are you sort of taking one point? Or, well, I guess first you have to like make some kind of box, initial box. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so then you have to check maybe all of the points. But then each iteration, you do you like take one point and then you start sort of Splitting the tree uh, or the thing if it's uh, if you if you go be, go beyond the threshold of points, or or do you have to go through all of the points each iteration step in the splitting algorithm? You have to uh, check. Oh, is this point in that? Oh, it's not. 
Yeah, I think in the, I guess in your C++ implementation, you have to do that. So with the box you split, you have the, the points residing in that one, we then have to, after the split, check, okay, which of the points resides on one side and which on the other. So in the sequential one, you have to do that. In the distributed one, you completely by, bypass that uh, yeah. restriction. And that's the main point because we, so the sparse trees allow, allow us to represent the data uh, once you know the how. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, um, Axel even implemented a much more efficient, what he calls the labeling, the leaf labeling. So you can go directly from the, the how to the leaf label with the any point. Yeah, the, that was already implemented, but I optimized it. There was yeah, some, yeah. Uh, yeah. you could just. And the distribution, is it like you take a chunk of the points and you sort of distribute like the same, okay, this, you take care of this part, take care of that part. So, um, so the data, just we don't actually, we don't know what data and the, where it resides on which computer. We actually, it is basically abstracted away to us. So the idea is that but it's not that they take care of the same point. Yeah, every machine is doing yeah. its own set of points, exactly. But there's no way out. Except because yeah. we find the how, right? So you need the minimum and the maximum. There, there, we find the minimum and maximum is dimensional, but all the points. Uh, once you have that how, yeah. that's what we call the root box, then you just share it to all the workers, and then the coding of the leaf label happens independently for each point. Yeah, there's some, a very, there's some very slight uh, communications happening in this, where is it? So if we look at the stages again, yeah, every machine can find it. Yeah, so every machine can find their own hull of its own points. And then yeah, we can basically just send every box hull from every box to the driver and find a box hull of those boxes or whatever. It's well, very, it's basically no communication happening at all here. At the second step, we actually do have some communications happening. So after we, for each point, we want to know which cell uh, any point resides in at some very refined depth, say a depth of 100. So we do an extreme amount of spinning. After we found every, cell box with some count, what we will actually end up with is like, we might have, we have, might have uh, that some one machine gets, finds that one cell has a point of one and another machine actually maps another point to the same cell. So we'll actually have two, uh, perhaps two versions of the same cell on different machines. So we do have to do, an all to all communication in this uh, algorithm, but uh, to just sum up the counts for every cells because we might get some cell two or one or two counts, or whatever. So then we get a lot more communications in the merging or backtracking stage. And then the, I haven't looked into this large stage when we find these minimum distance estimates, but there are some. We can do some distributed computing in it, but uh, yeah, the previous person we implemented it said that it is somewhat limited by uh, by sequential computing. And then another question: so in this pudding, is it possible that when you split, you actually get that? I don't know, like you get these rectangles becoming so narrower. <laughs> Or, or do you limit that? I'm thinking like you could regenerate if you just keep on splitting something and then uh, yeah, yeah, that you get very thin strips. Yeah, so since all this, all, the, all these things are based on regular pavings and regular pavings gives us this specific rule that we always split the side with the longest length. So we do not get those cases, unfortunately. And then are the re non regular pavings is that the I, I don't know about <laughs> that, but I, I assume they, they exist like uh, some other ways of partitioning. Uh, the asymptotic consistency theorems will hold uh, for density estimation and to allow arbitrary. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's confused. But, but, but do you, can, can you also think about instead of splitting, like, okay, you split it in half, but you split it in, I don't know, like, you know, depending on the dimension, like, you could see like, it's a square, you could split it into like, four squares, then, so that it will be like, I, I guess that is what is happening at this uh, distributed label. So, because what we basically do is we we take our box and we just split everything 64 times, perhaps. If we, if we choose a depth of 64. So, we do it. If we had a rectangular, yeah, if we look at. Uh, well, I'm thinking of keeping everything as a. Uh, Something regular like uh, cubes. So, so if you are split into cubes all the time, it's that beneficial in any way? I'm not sure. So, the theorem about asymptotic consistency relies on like some complexity arguments. You don't want the uh, there's some somehow you have to prove that the complexity of our histogram doesn't uh, grow too fast. So uh, there's a paper that like formalizes this, which this stuff is based on. But the idea is that you don't, you don't, you're not allowed to get two complex histograms because then we will also break this theorem. And that is why we have this count limit. So we are not allowed to have the count limit increase too fast uh, compared to the number of points. I think your question is probably more representation. So, yes, all the complete binary trees, which would be corresponding to these perfect squares, right? Two, one, three, so. uh, those are uh, embedded in the space, right? So, they are subsets of this embedded in the space. Mm -hmm. The big reason or advantage of this space is that it's close under uh, union of the big two regular bearings and all the label, you get another regular bearing in the same space. And it includes all the complete trees also, right? So it's the same structure underpinning process with the complete tree. So we don't have any chapters, but it's, it's these three steps. And because they're close under overlay operations, if we can figure out a way to quickly encode them using bit strings, so left is zero, right is one, right? So you use one directly in the sense of using the bit string once you know the column. That what we're effectively doing is moving all of the arithmetic directly to this binary situation. And what, and by the way, the whole point of all this is that you cannot do that estimation arbitrary like data sets, arbitrary like potential sets. So, so that's the. Uh, so yeah, Axel has pushed it a bit further than the others. So the benefit is it's always needed. Benefit is when you break down. Close. And as a sample size, right? So right now, the standard density estimators cannot even in one dimension analyze 800 billion points just to do density estimation. So, and of course, the point he's noticing is that even if we do all this optimization so far, we're still limited by the memory of the driver machine. Right? So Google doesn't have this issue, Facebook doesn't have this issue. Because they have public clouds, which is what these algorithms are running on. But then, if you only use eight data from any machine, we will hit limits anyway. If they have like that for one terabyte memory. So, so we will hit limits. <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, let's uh, move on because we have our next speaker. So, Thank you. let's thanks, Alex. Excellent.